So coal mining in the United States can be traced back three centuries to a humble start in the hills near Richmond, Virginia. It wouldn't really take off, though, until the late 18th century when mines would begin opening in Pennsylvania, followed soon after by surrounding states like Ohio and Illinois. Through the Revolutionary War, westward expansion, the Civil War, and even Industrial Revolution, coal mining would continue to evolve and grow, supplying the nation with energy and heat through the 19th and 20th centuries. While coal production in the United States has dropped in recent years, there was a time where the growth seemed never-ending. The first coal mine in Ohio opened sometime around the turn of the 19th century, with the first production of 100 tons of coal being reported in Jefferson County. By the early 20th century, many more mines had opened throughout the state, including a small operation in Millfield, Ohio in 1911, known as Poston No. 6. The number 6 mine would supply its first coal on March 4, 1912, and would continue operation until 1945. It was purchased in 1929 by the Sunday Creek Coal Company, one of the largest coal companies in all of the world at the time. They would temporarily close the mine starting on April 11, 1930, to make repairs and general improvements. Brick walls and I-beams were added to improve the stability of the mine. Electric lights and new tracks, along with a new ventilation shaft, would also help improve the safety for the workers. With the improvements, the mine was able to reopen, and by November of 1930, they were working 24 hours a day, five days a week, and hauling around 5,000 tons of coal out every 24 hours. Even with all the safety improvements, though, mining was still a dangerous job. Fires, collapses, carbon monoxide, and other dangers had taken lives in mines over the years, and each person that descended into the depths of the earth knew that day could be their last. From 1872 to 1930, nearly 90 people died in various accidents in Ohio mines. But one tragedy, just three weeks before Thanksgiving in 1930, would almost double the total death toll in the course of only a few moments. Join me in this episode of Legends and Tales as we cover the sad story of the Millfield Mine Disaster. Welcome to Legends and Tales. Today, we are in Athens County, Ohio. We're just about a mile east from uh, a little town called Millfield. Now, Millfield, Ohio is a very tiny town nowadays. As, according to the 2020 census, it had a population of 311 people. Now, that sounds small as it is, but believe it or not, that's tiny compared to what it was in the 1930s. So around 1930, they had a population of about 1,500 people. And a large number of those 1,500 people worked at right behind me. This right here used to be a coal mine, believe it or not. This was mine number six. And if not for one major event that happened, mine number six probably never would have been thought about as anything more than just a regular every everyday coal mine. But on November 5th, 1930, there was a tragedy that happened right here behind me 
that would dwarf anything that Ohio had ever seen and really has ever seen since just about. It was a pretty typical Wednesday morning. Clouds held the morning sun hostage as workers lined up at the elevator that would take them down nearly 190 feet deep into the belly of the earth. The chilly November air was enough to wake up even the sleepiest miners as they made their way into work that morning. And for those who were still not fully awake, the sight of some special visitors perked them up. A group of officials from the Sunday Creek Coal Company headquarters stood with a group of miners, waiting to make their way down on the elevators that lowered 10 men at a time into the mine. This group of VIPs included W.E. Titus, the president of the Sunday Creek Coal Company, and his vice president, P.A. Cohen, along with chief mine engineer H.E. Lancaster, mine superintendent Walter Hayden, and Mr. Titus's assistant H.H. H. Upson. The morning would unfold as any other, with the exception of the group of visitors touring the mine. By lunchtime, most of the workers were starting to think about evening plans and getting home to their families. Just after lunch at 11.45 a.m., the sound of an explosion from deep in the mine caught everyone off guard. Many of the men dropped to the ground, covering their heads and waiting for the worst. Those that didn't take themselves down were knocked off their feet by a powerful gust of wind from the main shaft. The wind would whistle around them, first blowing out and then sucking back into the hole it came from with a violent blast. Upon recovering, they quickly realized something terrible had happened deep within the bowels of the mine and made their way to the main motor road as quickly as possible to escape the chaos. So after the initial blast, nobody was really 100% sure what exactly had happened down in the mine. At first, they thought it was just a, a, a collapse. And they initially started setting up here in the town. They had a, uh, so they thought 150 miners were trapped. And they set up morgues in the storage room, the pool hall, and the company store here in town because this was a company town. So they went ahead and set up morgues just because they didn't know exactly how many people they were going to be pulling out of there alive and how many people might have been killed in the blast. So they came into town here, they set up the morgues, and prepared for the worst. So as families flooded to the area, eager to reunite with their loved ones who had been working in the mine, the Ohio National Guard was brought in to maintain order. Rescue efforts started right away but a buildup of carbon monoxide would hinder the search for survivors at first. Rescuers wearing self-contained breathing apparatuses provided by the U U.S. Bureau of Mines were finally able to make some headway into the more dangerous sections of the mine, but they found physical barriers including electric shuttle engines and mine carts blown off the tracks and I-beams ripped from the walls. Tracks as far as 760 feet from the source of the explosions had been ripped out and equipment as far away as 1,600 feet from the origin was found to be scorched. While assessing the damage, crews also worked to open back up the ventilation shafts to help clear the air. Canaries were carried into the mine with rescue personnel to help gauge the level of carbon monoxide, with many of the birds lasting only three or four minutes before being overcome. Due to the level of methane gas in the mine, it was determined that turning the power back on would pose too high of a risk of a secondary explosion, and mules were brought in to help clear the shaft and search for bodies. 78 bodies were recovered over the following day and a half, with an additional four being pulled out on November 7th. So some miners were able to get out on their, on their own. There were a lot of miners, though, that needed to be rescued, and some of them were actually rescued from inside the mine. So fire uh, foreman John Dean and fire boss James Mackey both were able to save several people. John Dean, he was carrying people. He was rushing back in, grabbing people, pulling them out. He was carrying them out uh, until the point where he collapsed and he physically could not move anymore, and they actually wound up having to pull him out as well. Uh, and then James Dean, or sorry, James Mackey. <laughs> uh, so James Mackey was down in the mine and he, he saw somebody down in one of the shafts. He was trying to crawl down to actually save that person. And as he got to them, they wound up dying in, basically in his arms when he, when he got there. And, but he didn't have time to wait because the, the gas and everything in the mine was building up. 
and he actually just barely made it out on his own. If he had waited even a couple of minutes or tried tried to pull that body out, he wouldn't have made it out himself. He would have died as well. So that was a couple of the, the heroes that were actually inside the mine. Um, Howard Davis, Howard and Frank Davis were another pair that they were brothers that worked in the mine together. Like I said, there's 1,500 people, and, and, and a lot of the people in this town were either related to somebody, they all knew each other, and most of them worked in the mine. So uh, the, the, Howard Davis and Frank, they were down there with a, a group of men trapped for 12 hours, and Frank actually watched, or, or I'm sorry, Howard actually watched his brother Frank die in a pocket of carbon monoxide. And he, there's nothing he could do about it because if he'd gone to him, he would have died as well. So he basically watched his brother pass out and die from carbon monoxide poisoning while he, while they were waiting to be rescued, just huddled up. There's a lot of group, groups of men that were huddled up inside the mine that just, they couldn't go anywhere. They had to wait for rescuers to arrive because they were trapped. So another sad story in this whole thing was Mrs. Goldie Fielder. So she was the spouse, the wife of Benjamin Fielder, who was a worker in the mine. And she actually worked just down the road at Chansey, which is another little town. We drove through it on the way here. I got some, some footage, so I'll put that up. But she, drove, or she was a telephone operator. So back in the early days of telephones, if you picked up your phone on your house, it wasn't like your cell phone where you're just calling a number and it's reaching a place. You picked up your house phone and it went to an operator. And then you told that operator who you were calling. And they would physically take a cord out and put it into another slot. And that's how they would route and direct your call. So Mrs. Miss Goldie Fielder, she was one of those telephone operators in Chansey. And as soon as the mine explosion happened, within about an hour or so, they called to get help. And she's the one that picked up the line. And they told her what had happened. And she could have easily panicked. You know, her husband was in the mine. She didn't know what had happened to him. She could have easily panicked, but she kept her cool. She took all of the information down, and then she called Athens and got a hold of the Athens operator to relay the message to them so that they could get the message to the, the, the state and federal agencies that needed to come in here to help to evacuate people and, and with cleanup and that kind of stuff. Um, after she got all of that done, she was finally able to leave and make her way to the mine. Unfortunately, and you'll see her husband's name. I'm not sure how well these are coming across. I hope they're coming across all right. But her husband's name is actually on here. He did not make it. He was one of the 82 people that wound up dying in the fire in the, in the mine explosion. So early newspaper reports did say 83 people. It was kind of up in the air. They weren't 100% sure. They said 78 were recovered. And then five were recovered a couple of days later. It wound up actually being 82 people that were killed in the disaster. Uh, the state... Uh, so at the, they did funerals over the next few days, and they said that there were 59 widows, 79 sons, 75 daughters that were left without a, without a parent, and one mother who even lost five sons. So she lost basically all of her children. She had five sons. All of them were lost in the mine accident. And then the state wound up paying for the burial. So the, the state allotted $150 for each person to be buried. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, in 1930s money, it was a lot more. So they paid for the burials, and then they paid out the workers' compensation claims to the families of the miners. Uh, each totaling, I think, it was about eight thousand dollars. The total was about seven hundred and twelve thousand dollars that it cost the state, which in today's money is about thirteen point five million dollars that was paid out to families as a result of the mine tragedy. One more story that I wanted to add in here that I didn't get a chance to talk about when I was actually on site was a story that I found from the Cincinnati Inquirer on November 6th, 1930. So this was a story that was put in the paper the day after this incident. All of the papers uh, far and wide were covering this story, but this one in particular caught my eye, and it is titled Bribes Fates with Life. Son of Minor Hurt Critically in Explosion Offers Blood to Save Parent from Death by Foster Egner. Athens, Ohio, November 6th. Our auto was one of the few passed by the state guard and allowed to travel up the narrow two-mile road to the mouth of the Sunday Creek Mine, rocked by a death-dealing explosion. There's hardly room for two autos to pass. We had to drive carefully, pulling to the side of the road for speeding ambulances, rushing victims of the explosion from the shaft to the improvised morgue. As our auto was passed by Colonel W.C. Christie, we were allowed to pass the sentinels stationed along the road. 
As we neared the mine, a frantic man jumped to the center of the road, waving his hands. We had to stop. He was a miner in working clothes. Turn around quick. I have to get a boy here for a blood transfusion for Eldon Will or, or Eldon Willis will die, he screamed. It was a narrow place to turn, but we made it. An ambulance barely missed us. Speed, for God's sake, cried the miner. The chauffeur shifted into high, and we dashed down the road. The miner in the back seat begged for more speed as we rocked down the road. He directed us to a small house and soon returned with the injured man's son. We started again for the mine. The miner was telling the boy, Carl, 17, that a blood transfusion was the only thing that would save his father. Sure, I'll give my blood, I'll give my life for dad, the boy replied quietly. As we neared the emergency hospital, the two jumped from the car and ran inside. Carl was rolling up his sleeve for the transfusion as he ran through the doorway. From what I can tell from my research, it looks like Eldon actually wound up making it. The only two Willises that I found on the list of, of miners who passed away were Andrew Willis and Oscar Willis. So it looks like that little boy was actually able to save his dad. So as in the last segment, we're, st we're standing here right next to the memorial. And this memorial plaque was dedicated... Uh, I don't know exactly when it was put up here. <laughs> it was put up here quite a way, quite, quite a long time ago. The city of Millfield here uh, used to hold a memorial every year on the anniversary of the of the explosion. I don't know if they still do. Like I said, it's a much smaller town. The that article I found was from 1995, so it's been about 30 years. So I'm not sure what's going on today. I couldn't find anything on that. Um, as far as the aftermath, so the, the mine reopened about a month after the accident. And so they had to go in, they had to clean everything up and make sure everything was was all good to go. And then they reopened the mine. I can't imagine what it would have been like to work in there after that, knowing what had happened. Uh, and it was open for an additional 15 years. It finally closed in 1945. I don't know whether it was a coincidence that it just happened to be around the end of World War II or if they just <laughs> ran out of coal. Um, but they did close the mine down in 1945. Now, as far as the cause of the explosion, there was a lot of speculation as to what could have actually been uh, the culprit. There's a lot of miners. There's actually a lot of miners that had their own versions of what they thought happened. A lot of them thought it was like a light maybe had sparked something. So what it turned out to be was a rock that had fallen in the mine uh, way down in there. And it had fallen and knocked over or actually severed <laughs> a cord that fell down next to a track that was in the mine for the rail carts and a electrical spark had sparked at just the right moment when a pocket of methane gas had built up in that area and that caused the explosion um everything else seemed like it was uh, good to go except for that one little thing and even afterwards like they didn't find anything that was uh, that stood out as, as negligence or anything like that so that's what the, the actual calls wound up being so that's the story of the millfield mine disaster from 1930 and it's a sad tale. There's a lot of different things, different elements of it. It's kind of, I want to say it's part of a bygone era in Ohio history, but there's still coal mines. There's still accidents. There's not nearly as many as there used to be. But even in recent years, we've seen accidents in different places around the world and, the, and even in the United States with miners getting trapped and cave-ins and that kind of stuff happening. So mining always has been and always will be a dangerous thing. It just so happened that this was the, the worst mine event in Ohio history, even to this day. So with that being said, I do want to take a quick minute to shout out. You can see I'm wearing the, the, the candles, candle in a story. So this is the part of the new merch line that I'm working on on the website. We, my wife and I have actually opened up a store. <laughs> we're selling homemade candles and some wax melts and all kinds of stuff like that. And a lot of this we're doing in person. So that's part of the reason why I've started to pick these things back up. So I'm, I'm going to be getting back into the looking for the history in Ohio and, and eventually surrounding states. But right now I'm really focused on Ohio. I'm not doing a timeline for these videos. I'm going to get them out when I can get them out. I want to give them the time and the care that they deserve. And I want to kind of revamp it and improve upon what I was doing in the past because I've got a lot of great stories and tales that I've, I've covered. Uh, but I want to be continually improving, continually getting better at it and focusing solely on this for the short term. Um, as far as YouTube's concerned, outside of that, there's a million other things I got going on, but we'll talk about all that in a different video. 
Uh, but I do want to thank you all for watching. I will throw the, the names of the patrons up at the end of the video here. So I'll throw those up as well as some bloopers. I want to keep doing that kind of stuff because I liked, I liked how I ended that before. So we're going to keep doing the bloopers and that kind of stuff. So stay tuned for that. I want to thank you all for watching. Everybody have a great rest of your day. And I will see you in the next one. Coal mine. Or <laughs> coal mine. Let me get this. Let me get, try to get this correctly. Uh, what it turned out to be was heavy traffic all day long through the small town of Millfield, Ohio. <laughs> we good now. So what it turned out to be. I need to get rid of the, the laughing. Uh, it just so happens that, you know, this was the deadliest mine event and mine accident in Ohio history. Lordy, lordy. All the trucks, all the cars. In Ohio, eventually surrounding states. No, we probably live there. I'll wait till it's done. <laughs>